Wow. I can't believe that a network that's so opposed to gender-affirming surgery just cut off their own dick. reason was, Tucker's firing is going to leave a huge white power vacuum at Fox. <laughs> From a defabricated solar-powered garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, tips on keeping up with your vaccinations when your faithful Australian shepherd suddenly thinks you're a sheep. And now, the podcast host who has no need for micromanagement from animals because he's got an imaginary producer for that, Pete Dominic. And thank you very much, Pete Cohen, to my imaginary producer. You are looking great today. I mean, you are really looking good. You are something else. Wait, I think I'm kind of harassing my imaginary producer. It's okay. It's non-existent. They are non-existent. My imaginary producer is non-binary and non-existent, so don't get all worked up. All right. Hello. Welcome to the big program. Is it a big program? Is it a small program? It's a show. I produce it, book it, host it, and edit it, and then post it each and every day. So it's a big program to me. That's for darn sure. Yesterday, I put out a special, spectacular, a bonanza, extravaganza in the afternoon or early evening with five great guests. If you haven't listened to that somehow, if you missed, I talked to the great Ellie Mistal, Jeff Jarvis, Danielle Moody, Jared Yates Sexton, and Juliet Jeske, all of whom had very interesting things to say in the wake of Fox News firing Tucker Carlson. By the way, that was Desi Lytic at The Daily Show at the opening of the program. And so go back and listen to that episode of the show. And today I've got Ryan Bussey back on the program. Ryan, of course, is the former firearms manufacturing company executive. He worked at a company called Kimber, and he helped build it into one of the most iconic gun companies. He won all kinds of awards for that job, but he basically came to it a very important point decision in his life where he realized that they were doing the wrong thing and he was a part of the problem. So he became a part of the solution. He is the author of the great book, Gunfight. My battle against the industry that radicalized America. And he was just on The Daily Show. He's been on that show, I think, twice. He's testified in front of the Senate. He has been interviewed by just about everybody. He's got district attorneys around the country calling him or attorneys general, I think he said. Anyway, great conversation with Ryan Bussey on today's episode of Stand Up. Skipping the news segment today because it's just going to take too long and I want to get this up for you early here in the morning. Yesterday, I was heavily focused on the extravaganza bonanza just mentioned, and it seems like it's dominating the news. Obviously, on a day like that, there are so many other things that go undercover, so probably the best day for me to do the news, but scheduling-wise, just can't make it work, so I'll give you a very comprehensive segment on tomorrow's show in case you really missed it. But right now, uh, my conversation with Ryan Bussey is what I've got for you here on a Tuesday, the 25th of April, 2023. I love talking to him, grateful to have him and for what he's done and been saying for over the past year. And of course, I can't have these conversations without your support. So please subscribe to the show, StandUpWithPete.com or Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Welcome to new subscribers. You all get shout outs. I hope to see you at the Hangout on Thursday night. But right now, let's do it ryan bussy all right ryan bussy is back and very happy to have him so much to talk about it's been what over a year since the book's out it's out in paperback and you've been traveling all over the country we've seen you in washington dc testifying we've seen you on tv on almost every big show how are you how are you doing how has this last year been for you dude it's good to see you you know these are the sort of things you hope happens when you write a book that you want to make a difference, right? I, this isn't like this isn't a comedy book, and it's not a uh, it's not a young adult book. It's not a, all the different genres. It's 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 a social science book that I hoped it's my memoir, right? I hoped it made a difference. So, um, doing all this appearing and speaking and testifying and you know everything else that's that's what you hope. Now, 
it's also the sort of book that I wished I wasn't on air all the time. Like, because last week I've, I've been on CNN and MSNBC. I'm in LA, right? I'm in LA right now. And it's because a kid got shot in Kansas city and a young girl was killed in North Albany and a cheerleader was shot in Texas and, 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 right. It just keeps coming. And we haven't made enough changes in the country. So it's, I guess to tell you, Pete, I mean, it's exciting from the book standpoint, but I, but I wish it wasn't quite so frequent. Yeah, I understand that. And yet I'm still interested because you and I become friends, of course, with what it's been like for you and what this experience has been like. And if, if, if anything, what you've learned and also, you know, now you are a recognizable face, which you've been brave to put yourself out there. Obviously, your family's put your, themselves out there. We can talk about your sons who actually are pursuing a whole different issue, I hope, uh, in a minute. But you've been on all of these shows. You've been on The Daily Show a couple times just now, just recently with Jordan Klepper, which is a great segment. What, is, what has changed in your life since you've become a much more public person outspoken against your former industry and employer? Yeah, so I, it certainly certainly kind of rules my day, and and um, I mean, at any time I get a phone call or do a CNN hit or an MSNBC hit, that's definitely changed. Um, I'm getting a lot of calls from states attorney general across the country because there's a lot of laws that are being challenged, and they just don't have. I don't really weigh in on the law per se. I'm not an attorney. I didn't write the laws, but they've never had anybody who knows guns just be friendly just be expert for them in, in these legal cases, you know, like what is an assault weapon? What is an AR 15? What's the history of it? How did it enter the industry? The stuff that I write about in the book, like, because nobody from the industry would ever speak to these people. And so my day is often taken up trying to help them. And so it's definitely changed a lot. That part of my life has changed. And yet the part with my kids and my wife and spending time doing the stuff we love and being with our family, none of that has changed. So, you know, just the professional over outward side has. Yeah. You guys take a trip. The family took a trip. You, you shared we it did. on Instagram, right? We did. We, uh, my oldest son turned 18 and he loves, uh, he had gone to London for a kind of a youth exchange trip when he was in, in junior high. And all he wanted to do is get back to Europe. So we kind of dirt bag backpacked it across Europe for 10 days. Um, well, England and France, all of Europe and he had our backpacks and stayed in little Airbnbs and ate too much, too many French croissants and drank too much French wine. But yeah, we, we did that. Val and I are taking the girls at the end of June to Europe, uh, to Switzerland and Italy, where her family, we're going to end up at their place in Sicily. And, and uh, I'm going to have to talk with you about what worked and what didn't, because we're doing a similar thing. Yeah, it was great. I tell you one thing, uh, funny to speak about my boys, like, you know, the drinking age is, is eight in 18 in France. I think it's much, even lower than that, like in some, in some places, but, uh, of course we're right across from this little bar in France and I couldn't find Lander and he's over drinking with the French guys because he's 18. So that was funny, but, um, yeah, that, that you know, whole different culture there. Your sons Lander and badge are, yeah profiled in a recent New York Times piece, including a photograph of them. The, the headline reads, in Montana, it's youth versus the state in a landmark climate case. Sixteen young Montanans have sued their state, arguing that its support of fossil fuels violates the state constitution. David Gellis writing the piece, who's a really great journalist over at the New York Times. People should go read or you can even listen to this one. Tell me just a, a little bit about your sons and how they got involved in this lawsuit in, in Montana, which I'm guessing their buddies aren't joining them on. So, yeah, there's that piece. And then there's a really great Rolling Stone piece by Cassidy Randall that profiles them even more. Oh, great. Um, I didn't know that. You didn't send me that one. I didn't. Yeah, so that one that one's really good. And it, it really go, It really profiles. That's so cool. The, right. Because, um, but so basically in Montana, um, we have sort of this. We had this era when we were all but a colony for extractive industry. After that, in the 1970s, a bunch of common citizens got together and said, we need to rewrite our constitution. And it needs to be and it, and it ended up being one of the most progressive and beautiful constitutions anywhere in the world, but certainly in, in the 50 states. In the constitution, there is a line in there that says the citizens of Montana are guaranteed a clean and healthful environment. It's in our constitution. Well, the state of Montana also owns lots of uh, land 
that is used to fund schools and has long prioritized fossil fuel development on that land. So the first time, and it's been tried in many states, many places, the youth, 16 kids, my kids are two of them, are suing the state of Montana saying, hey, you prioritizing fossil fuel development is violating our constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. And for the first time in the country, it's going to court. It's going to court in June. Um, these 16 kids will be there. Uh, it's a huge national news because if they succeed, they will essentially, on behalf of all the kids of Montana, force the state of Montana to change its fossil fuel prioritization. And that could have huge national waves. So that's kind of what's going on. I hope on. somebody's already making a documentary about these 16 young people. Yeah, I um, I don't know if they are, but they're what's hilarious. So a lot of people that criticize them fly in and even some of the journalists, I think even David ask this sort of question like, oh, I bet your parents are putting you up to this. Oh, I bet the lawyers are putting you up to this. Oh, I bet you don't even know what's going on. Oh, you, you are just kids or just tools. I'm like, have you met these kids? Like, we were not. The hilarious thing is, Pete. David, New York Times, he comes to our house. We were not even there. Sarah and I had had left for the weekend for this political thing we were doing. And the two boy, our two boys are there with New York Times reporter and their photographer. We were not even in the house. Wow. Um, and this is sort of like the lawsuit. The, I, I think you I've seen you note this and um, I see it firsthand. This generation is taking no shit from anybody. Um, they're not waiting until they're 30 to do stuff. They know they can have an opinion. They, they don't, they don't think they have to have degrees and, and, and wait till the professional, this, that, or the other to make an impact on the yeah. world. They are just doing stuff. And I think this is a, a really beautiful illustrative case of that. You are the quintessential free range parent out there in Montana, you and your wife, <laughs> And you let your kids do anything outside, which is great. Yeah. And you let them do anything inside. Well, you know, I don't know what the rules are in terms of their relationship with media, et cetera. Uh, but obviously, they're super responsible about firearms and so on. But, I mean, talk about free range. Letting them be interviewed by a, a journalist from New York Times about this case and not being in the room. Yeah, not even been in the house, not even been in the town. Yeah. And um, but it, it just for me, it just sort of goes to the point like, no, parents are not controlling this. Yeah. Parents are not driving. Right. This. Well, yeah. The, the more importantly, yes. It. More importantly. Yes. That's great. Well, people should read all about it and catch up on uh, on this. There's now two pieces about Ryan's kids and all these other young people who are filing this suit. And it's going to be a really important thing to watch. And I love what you said about this generation and I'm super inspired by your sons and by you guys, your whole family. So let's get back to uh, though the book and your work. It's out in paperback. Uh, what what have, have you learned anything? You've been answering a lot of questions from journalists, from politicians. In the past year, though, you've been writing more and more and speaking on this issue as it continues to evolve, unfold, arguably get worse. Have you learned anything? I've learned, yeah, I have, um, good and bad. The, on the good side, most gun own, I've, I've learned that most gun owners are not okay with the status quo. I've learned that people are fed up. I've learned that people definitely want change. And that, and that most citizens understand the nuance of this and other issues. In, in other words, we can have guns in our society, but we can't have guns with no regulation or no social norms. Right. It's not an all or nothing argument for almost everybody in the United States is OK with that. On the other hand, I have also learned that the industry and the political system that profits from the division and this totem, specific, uh, oftentimes specifically the AR-15, they are not going to back down. It is going to get much worse. They are not nuanced. Um, and, and the analogy I used yesterday in uh, in the L.A. Times book thing here I was doing is that, you know, background checks polls at 82, 83, 84 percent. Right. Nothing. Nothing else pulls that high. Right. Yet since Columbine 1999, it's pulled that high and we still ain't doing anything about it. Lots of Republicans have to support it for it to pull at 82 to 85 percent. Lots of them. And yet we do nothing on it. And people ask me a lot, like, well, why is that? You say people are nuanced and accept this, but we, ne we don't do anything. Good question. And I've come to understand it's because guns are the central totem of the right now. Hmm. 
think about it like a beam in your house. You can know it's full of asbestos, right? You can look up there like, well, we might get cancer over time. It's bad. Maybe we should replace it. But it's the central beam in your house. You know if you pull it out of your house, your whole house crumbles. So do you live with a little bit of asbestos and like think, yeah, it's bad. I know I'm like if I'm pulled on it, I would say we should probably get the asbestos out. And then when somebody (laughs) says, okay, let's yank the beam out, like, whoa, 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 that's our house. It's going to crumble. That's what's going on on the right side. The guns are the beam, and and we're not going to make any progress there because the whole house would crumble on the right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting metaphor because it's the underpinning of their character, of their ego, of their identity for a certain large percentage of people. You say on the right, but I, get, I mean, I'm, I don't know how many people – there are how many voters, but it, 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 I, we do know how many guns that there are. And, I, well, I want to ask you this. You mentioned just now, and all the Sunday shows led with this story about these accidental shootings that have yeah. taken place over, like, the last week. Everybody knows about them. I don't need to repeat them. You mentioned them. Is there anything, is that different? Because some of them, at least, were, were we were told that the person inside the house was glued to a screen where someone was constantly screaming to them about how much danger they're in and that their home was going to be invaded to the point where someone did accidentally knock on the door, accidentally pull in the driveway, get in their car. That was the kind of motivated, instigating potential message that they were hearing. What do you make of these kind of random shootings? Should we be talking about them any differently? No. Well, there's going to be more of them, okay? It's going to be a lot more because I don't know if you've noticed that the sort of hateful rhetoric that was first, by the way, first developed and perfected and honed by the NRA, this, they are coming to get you. It's an existential battle. They want to take all of your guns. They want to extinguish your lifestyle. Like, man, if you got pound, as Barack Obama once said, if I watch Fox News, I'd hate me, right? You know, like, if 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 there's enough of that, yeah. if, if you absorb enough of that, if I absorb enough of that, sooner or later, we're pissed off, we're angry, we're fearful, we're prone to conspiracy theories. And then you throw 415 million guns in the United States, not with more regulation, with less regulation. Now, we, we now have 26 states where you don't even have to have a permit to carry the guns. So you have an ever-increasing conspiratorial and hate-filled part of our media culture and society and more guns. And by the way, lots of these guns now, as opposed to 15 years ago, are sold as, air quotes here, tactical guns, right? The tactical market is huge. I don't know if you know this. You can have tactical underwear. You can have tactical socks. You can have tactical helmets, bulletproof vests, gloves, guns, ammo, holsters, belts. Like, I could keep going on. You know that I know that because I have all of that. It's just that I use it for gardening because it's dual purpose or multi-purpose, really. But but the the point here is, is that tactical means planned military operation an offensive operation. So if you gear yourself up your whole life yeah. around this readiness to be offensive, yeah. So like I tell people, you put 400 million hammers in society, sooner or later somebody's going to find an F and nail, man. Yeah, I had this I had this situation. I think I shared this with people. I was at the grocery store and I saw uh, a guy I know. We're friendly, but he's a big trumper, but we're always friendly and and uh he says to me, I thought that cart shopping cart was was potentially in our way because it was a potential shooter who wanted to block the exits. And I was like, that's why you thought that shopping cart was in the way of the door? He goes, you never know. You got to be ready. (laughs) And then I had some fun with him. And then he said, I always carry a gun. And then I said to him, because I just needed to top him, I said, I always carry two guns. They are strapped to my ankles. But I know... I'm so bad with them that if there were an active shooter, I would fumble them taking out, trying to get them out and then end up hitting him with the rake over there and getting shot. The point being, my point being <laughs> that I don't care how ready you are. It doesn't really I don't really think about that. That's a real problem that everybody's ready. You shouldn't be thinking about being ready, probably so much. I guess that's that's sort of the point here with these most recent shootings like the guy in Kansas City. I guess he was ready. I mean, 16-year-old honor student knocked on his door, and he was freaking ready. Yeah. Um, the, the guy in Albany, you know, a couple kids uh, make the wrong turn in his driveway. Looks like he was ready. Been sitting there on his porch for, for maybe for years ready. Um, is that – it's not about laws, really, to me. 
it's past that. Is it, the question is, is that really the kind of culture we want to live in? Right. And I think that's your point with you're joking with your Trump buddy, right? Like, dude, you really want to be fearful of a shopping cart? This is how you live your life? I think, by the way, there's just to be clear, a, a big difference between situational awareness and irrational behavior and you know, when someone knocks on your door, I think we all, especially nowadays, and we have doorbells, you know, with cameras on and we all are like, who's knocking on a door at this point? I understand uh, if someone, you know, pulls in your driveway. I mean, it seems someone's ball came in your yard. I mean, some of these are pretty, pretty absurd. But just the, the, the point of the difference between living one way, understanding, hey, I'm in this situation. I'm in a crowd. I'm in a thing. But but not deciding against going every time and not thinking that if you're there being, uh, you know, high anxiety the whole time, which is I'm not judging anybody. A lot of people feel that way, as you know, they don't even want to go out anymore because of these things they hear in the news. And I think that's probably irrational, in my opinion. Yeah. So, and, and my book, this is why I wrote the book, right, because people are they don't know how we got here. How did we come from right. 25 years ago when we would knock on each other's doors and when, you know, kids like me grew up hunting and shooting with their fathers and guns weren't everywhere and they weren't the central totem of the right. And, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Thomas Massey and Lauren Boebert didn't put them on their Christmas cards. And how did we get from there to here? And I lived right in the cauldron that cooked this whole thing up and it like it greatly distressed me. Right. So the book is about my life and and how we got here. But I. I to your to your point and to to a point I often make, um, we can own guns as as Americans. We have owned them. It's an immensely powerful freedom. Um, there's debate all the time about what the Second Amendment says, but let's stipulate like there's a right to own guns and we're going to continue to own guns. But something that powerful cannot be untethered from decency, social norms, and responsibility. You, you, we don't do it with any other aspect of our life. We don't say, well, look, here you go, son, you're six. Go drive the NASCAR through town, and that's, there is no school zone. Like, wait, that's silliness. Yeah, but there's no constitutional right to a car. You'll bring up all these other examples of we don't not have fences around pools or we don't not label poison, but those aren't constitutional rights, Ryan. What do you say to those arguments? I say, so what? <laughs> that doesn't mean we shouldn't regulate our, our, our uh, something so powerful as as the Second Amendment and as guns. And if you think not regulating them is the way you want to go, well, I hope you like this deal in Kansas City. I hope you like your daughter turning into the wrong driveway in Albany. I, I I hope you like sending your kids to school in places like Uvalde and Sandy Hook and like because that's what comes from divorcing responsibility and regulation and social norms from something as powerful as guns. And you know, Clarence Thomas can you know talk about no laws in 1791 and say that domestic abusers should be able to have their guns because their domestic abuse wasn't even a thing in 1791. I say. You know what? I, I say bullshit. Is that the kind of country we want to live in? Really? I, I mean, I don't. I don't want to I don't want to not have guns and be able to go hunting and shooting and, and own guns with my boys. True. I also don't want to live in that country. So, like, come back to the middle here. And the, the, the magic of democracy happens in the messy gray space right in the middle. And that's what responsible people do. It's never going to be perfect. But it can't be pulled so far right or left that that, that things don't work. And I, I'm telling you, our balance is way, way off. Right yeah, now. yeah. Well, our balance is way, way off. I mean, in a huge way because of the Supreme Court. And you mentioned Clarence Thomas. You were joined me here with Eric Siegel a few months ago to talk about a recent decision. There's more decisions coming. And I wanted to get your take on what has changed with the courts since you wrote this book. I would tell you, so that episode we did with the good professor um, was so prescient, really, because he warned, you, you, you better you better hold on, boys, because it's going to get worse. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm here to tell you, it is getting worse. There are the basics of public safety regulation across our country, in states across the country, is all up for debate now, thanks to Clarence Thomas's Bruin decision. Um it, it may be like 
you drive to school, take your kids to school one day and there's lots of stop signs and stoplights. And then the next day you drive and I'm like, wait a second, the stoplights and stop signs are all gone. That, that's what it's potentially going to feel like. Um, so I think everything is up for debate with regards to um, public safety and firearms regulation, whether any sort of firearm can be prohibited in any state or municipality, whether whether there is any limitation on any um, magazine capacity anywhere, anytime, all that's up for debate. It's it's hard because I want to talk with you about what works and have you define a few different things. But it seems like no matter in terms of regulations, in terms of laws, but it always feels like it's going to no matter what we decide here in the conversation, much less uh, policies at the state and federal level, they could be overturned by this court. Is that Am I right about that? Yes, you are right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think this is why I keep coming back to this idea of much of what I saw in the industry and much of what we saw during the Trump years, which I think which I pose in the book, you know, are obviously related. They weren't really legal changes. They weren't really litigation changes or laws. They were over changes in our social norms. Right. What Trump did. I mean, yes. I think he did lots of illegal shit, and I hope he's locked up for, you know, eons. But but still, the most damaging things he did, I think, to our country revolve around the way he broke down social norms. And the same thing happened in the firearms industry 10 or 15 years ago. AR-15s have been legal for a long time. Even through the assault weapons ban, AR-15s were perfectly legal. You couldn't – they became an assault weapon if you added additional features to them, but they were still legal. Even after that, they – you know, after the ban – sunsetted, they were obviously legal. The industry did not just race out and make them and market them and produce them and have egregiously irresponsible advertising. They didn't do it, not because of legal reasons, but because there was a social norm that the industry understood. We don't do this because bad shit's going to happen in our country if we do. Like it was voluntary. So that didn't take two thirds votes in the Senate and all the difficult things that have to happen for laws. It just took a bunch of people not doing stupid shit. Um, and that's not a hard thing to do. <laughs> well, it is, but it is because you tell us it is because there's a tremendous amount of money to be made. So th- there's a lot of money to be made in selling and doing dangerous things to the environment, which is what your sons are fighting against, much less to our bodies with bullets and guns. I mean, that's why they did it. It wasn't, it wasn't stupid. It's not stupid to make tons of money, even if young people are going to die. Right. Yeah. So I think it's immoral. Yeah, it's immoral. Right. And you hit you hit on something. Quarterly capitalism is now wrapped up into many of the things that we're fighting. And if and I have explained this to many people who look at some of the ads, maybe I write about in the Atlantic or I I told Jordan Klepper about it at our house the other night. He's like, you know, how is that? Like, how does somebody look themselves in the eye and run that ad? I'm like, let me tell you how they do it. Yeah. You're you're a VP of sales at a gun company. You have a quarterly number you're going to hit. That sort of hate, fear, and conspiracy drives sales. It's the same sort of thing that drove people to the polls for, for Trump. And you're like, let's see. Do I want to make my sales number and hit the quarterly number, or do I want to lose my job? And so you do it. And so does the rest of the industry. And they keep going. And it's hard to get off the drug, right? That's the same thing that's driving the climate thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a hard It's hard for anybody, you know, to get off, you know, and, and to some extent, it's like, well, if I leave this job, how am I going to get health insurance for my kids? I mean, it's it's complex. I think it it's fair to say, but the, the quarterly capitalism point basically is, you know, you got to make more money, you got to bring up the shareholder value. So you got to sell more in this case, guns or oil, whatever it is. And so if the question is, you know, the que- the only question is, how do we do that? Well, what about the, the cost of people's lives? Doesn't matter. How do we yeah. sell more guns and bullets? And so what has changed in the last year or since you left the industry in terms of marketing, in terms of these gun shows, Jordan Klepper takes us to a gun show at the Daily Show the other day. It doesn't matter if there's a shooting of a dozen children in a classroom. They're still having the gun show the next week, unless it's maybe in that town. I don't know. But what's changed in terms of marketing, in terms of laws, in terms of culture and conversation around the the marketing and selling of guns and and ammo in the last time you write so much about that in the book, but even more, what's it trending? Uh, First off, let's start with the laws. Um, We do have some minor improvements since the uh, U.S. Senate passed legislation last year. It's not it's not what you would call earth shattering to most folks. It's insufficient. It does. Requ- it does fund ERPO laws, meaning red flag laws that identify dangerous that help 
identify dangerous people and take their guns away before they do bad things. It funds some community violence uh, intervention. It's, it does some good things. It, it doesn't do, it doesn't pass the assault weapons ban. Again, that's since 1999, we haven't done, but it made some marginal improvements. So there's a little bit of cultural improvement there. I think more importantly, from my standpoint is 65 senators voted yes on that, meaning there were 15 Republican senators that stuck their neck out and said yes. And as minor as it was on guns, that's something because that tells you there's a bubbling up of frustration from the populace. Now, with regards to the industry and marketing and all the stuff that's sort of every day on the ground, dude, it's worse and it's going to get worse um, because capitalism is ruling the game and these sorts of advertisements are going to keep driving further. I just saw one yesterday I, or a couple of days ago. I posted on Twitter. There is an ad for air 15s and accessories and guns that says the best defense is a good offense. Mm. After all, after all of these kids and cheerleaders and, and, and Ralph Yarrow and Kansas city have been shot offensively. Um, here's an ad that says the best defense is a good offense. Really? Like we're just going to, now we're going to march up and down the streets offensively. So those things are getting worse. Let me ask you how, I mean, you point to there not being a conscience, a moral conscience, uh, if the bottom line is quarterly profits, your job. I mean, we can we can talk about that. I think that people can relate to that no matter what their job is. They know they might be doing damage here or there, and there's some guilt there. You try to balance it and, and, and justify it. You couldn't do it anymore. In the chapter, Speaking Truth, the Bullshit, in your book, you take us through your kind of evolution and, and what changed. You were inspired by people like Brene Brown. Like what we need is more people who are making a fortune, uh, who have a change of heart or mind the way you did and a complete reversal and become basically a whistleblower on his former industry. There aren't a lot of people like you. And and tell us how you did it as you do in the book, which I think is a really poignant and important and inspiring part of your book. Well, one thing is that I never, I never succumbed to the most of the actions that I criticize heavily in the book. The company that I worked for, we never built AR-15s. I didn't sell AR-15s. We didn't make this crazily marketed battle gear and tactical stuff, and you know, wrapped in strange incendiary politics. And we didn't, we didn't do that um, because the industry that I got in. 25 years ago, told me you didn't do that. Um, the industry changed around me. And so I finally got to a point where I understood that even though I was not doing it, I was part of the entity that was doing it. And there was no way to divorce what I thought I was doing okay from what the industry was doing. Because the industry, in the same way, I think, Pete, like a lot of evangelical Christians have sort of been pulled into this, well, I'm not like that. Well, sooner or later, the whole church is, and then sooner or later, 87% of evangelicals are voting for Trump, and there is no way to hold a different opinion. Like, you can't, you can't be in there and not be of it, and that's the way I felt. And honestly, it pissed me off. Um, when I, and I did come to believe that the firearms industry started Trumpism, handed it off to Trump, Trump put it on steroids, and then the firearms industry, I mean, there were very few industries that were deemed essential during the pandemic. Remember, the first one, guns. Guns and gun stores were deemed essential during yeah. the pandemic. That was a that was a payback from Trump. We see now that guns, AR-15s, are the central totem of Trump and Trumpism. Like January 6th, did you see a lot of Chevy truck flags? I didn't. I saw AR-15 flags, right? It's the central thing. So when I I look in the mirror and said, wait a second, I'm whether I want to, whether I think I am or not, I'm fueling that. I mean, my industry is fueling that. I, I gotta do something about it. If I care as much as I say I do, I got to do something about it. So that's why I'm here. Well, you are quintessentially being the change that you want to see in the world, and so are your sons. Really happy that people are listening to you. As we know, we wish we, you, know, you weren't out there having to talk about this, but I'm glad that you are. I think that's important. And uh, people should go get the book if they haven't gotten it, Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry That Radicalized America. Ryan, great pleasure to see you and talk to you, and hopefully – Soon, uh, we will hold each other at a mountaintop in Montana. It sounds so soothing. Let's do it soon. <laughs> All right. There he goes, Ryan Bussey, everybody. Go get the book, Gunfight. Go follow him on social media. Go watch him speak. He gave a TED Talk. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and got as much out of it as I did. I should probably say that after every conversation. Because 
a good good thing to say. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. That's why I love doing this work because I get to learn so much from these smart people every day with their insights and expertise. And I also learn a lot preparing to talk to them, reading and studying their work. So thank you is what I'm trying to say for your support and listening to the show and paying to subscribe to the show and going and rating and reviewing the show so that I can continue to do this work that I love so much. And hey, if you want support on your work, which I've tried to do very often, let me know what you do and we can talk about it. Maybe we'll get some plugs and that'll be a real game changer for you. (laughs) Somewhat uh, presumptive. Okay, that's it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Hope you're doing all right. And here's a fun one from Walt Whitman. Keep your face always toward the sunshine, and shadows will fall behind you. Thanks, Walt Whitman. You got to rise up. You got to stand up. You got to stare the devil straight in the eyes. You got to let him know it's his time to go. See it clear and all you hear is a lie. Don't get up off of your butt. Get down off of your fence. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in. With other causes for laws and sins, they weren't even sin. They knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go. And make it clear and all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the darkness